Good morning and welcome to New Craig's Evangelical Church Online on the final service in what has been an unforgettable year. I hope that those of you who were able enjoyed to see loved ones um, for at least part of the day, indoors, outdoors, um, on Christmas Day. Uh, and those who weren't um, can look forward to a time later in the year when this will be possible. This highlights the importance of our relationships with our family and friends. Reflecting on last week's carol service, it was good to, to sing praises to our King, but it reminded me of how much we're missing singing together as a fellowship. It will be so much better um, to join together with our brothers and sisters in our church family to sing to God's praise. So we look forward um, we have a hope that COVID will be under control soon and we have a hope that uh, in the future we can sing together here on earth um, but also looking to a time where we can sing together with the heavenly host in a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more suffering and every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. Jesus has given us the best hope we have for our eternal futures. Now, just thinking about um, the coming year, um, we've I've certainly enjoyed um, Tim Keller talking us through the Psalms. Um, for 2021, we will be guided through the book of Proverbs in Tim Keller's book, The Way of Wisdom, available from 10 of those Com. Um, there will also be daily readings from the New Testament on the church website um, and we're looking forward to the week of prayer in the new year from Monday the 4th of January to Friday the 8th. Um, watch out for notifications on the New Craig's Comms and the Facebook page. Now to focus our mind on the Word of God then we're going to read from chapter 42. And this is roughly 700 years before the birth of Christ. And this, this chapter is entitled, The Servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout, or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teachings the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in the darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Now, let's prepare room in our hearts to listen to God's word. Let's sing joy to the world and away in the manger.
We thank you for all your blessings during 2020 and for keeping us in your hand. We thank you for answered prayer and for all that has encouraged us in our faith this year. Above all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. For the future, dear Lord, we ask that you would lead and guide us on. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and we want to throw off everything that hinders and run the race you have marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Help us to consider him who endured opposition from sinners so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Help us always to remember and be confident in this, that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until his return. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks Rob and Anne for your prayers and for our church today. Um, now we're going to sing um, another Christmas song in Silent Night. And then Sophie Broughton is going to read a passage of scripture. Um, which Adam has based the sermon on today.
after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose it went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank you to all those who have taken part this morning. Uh, let me add my welcome uh, to Church Online this morning and to the last Sunday of 2020. And I think I almost heard a collective uh, cheer or a collective sigh of relief as we step into 2021. And we trust that it will be a brighter year for us. Uh, for this morning, we're going to carry on in the Christmas narrative in Matthew chapter 2, the passage that Sophie read for us. But I want to begin with a poem. It's not a Christmas poem, but it's an intriguing poem nonetheless. It's called Psychote. And have a listen and see if you like it as much as I do. It goes like this. Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. And the reason I like it is because I think it illustrates the dilemma that many people have with God because they sort of wish that God was there and they wish that he wasn't there. Uh, they want to meet him, but then they don't want to meet him. So on the one hand, people find it difficult perhaps to believe in God. 
And maybe it's because we live in a cynical and sceptical age. But then on the other hand, there is a sense in which people are intrigued at the possibility that there is someone there on the stairs. There might be a God. Perhaps he does exist. And we know people who search for him in real personal terms that actually affects the way that they live. And yet at the same time, we declare independence and we certainly don't want a God interfering with our lives. So at one moment, people want God. The next, they're anxious to flee from him. And maybe that sums you up when it comes to God. To protest, leave me alone, God, and yet really fearful of being alone. And we don't want to be alone. Is there anyone there? Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. Is he there? Is he not? Is there anybody out there? And that question sticks with us because one thing you can certainly say about the human race is that we are seekers. We're always looking for something beyond ourselves. Is there more to life than this, we ask? And we are made in such a way to search for something bigger than ourselves, to, to orbit our lives around. You know, sometimes we might suggest it's money. Uh, something bigger than we realize that's more powerful than us if we can get hold of it. You know, sometimes it's about relationships. Maybe it's about travel experiences around the world. Maybe it's simply watching a Netflix show or a skybox set. And you know what happens when you come to the end of a series. You just don't know what to do because there's been something to orbit your life around for that time. Now, in the reading in Matthew 2, we see a number of people who are being confronted on the stairs, as it were, with someone there. And some of those people don't want someone there and others do. And then we see what it is that these people orbit their lives around. So that's what I want to spend a few minutes looking at this morning. Uh, these are the seekers. And perhaps that's where you are. That's where you find yourself at Christmas time, perhaps as you've celebrated Christmas, but you're still unsure what Christmas is all about. So let's look, let's look at seeker number one. Uh, we often refer to them as the wise men. Um, there's a whole group of them, a whole group of seekers. But actually, we don't know much about them. We don't actually know if they were men. Uh, the original script of the Bible just calls them magi. So they may have been wise men or women. Uh, more likely, they would probably have been a mixture, you know, a whole group of them. And when you investigate the word magi, they were basically the scientists of the day. They were observers of the world around them, and they look out to see if there is any meaning in the universe. They're the watchers of the sky, the watchers of the heavens, the watchers of the stars and the planets, uh, just like we tried to do the other evening. And I guess if they were on our television sets, they would have presented the sky at night because they would discuss philosophy and they would want to learn about what is true and how do you know what truth is. And they were observers seeking answers to questions and wanting answers to the big questions of life. And we're told they came from the east to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is the city of the great king of the Jews, King David. And we often sing at Christmas time, what's in Royal David City? And Jerusalem means peace. And so they come from the east to another world under another king and there's peace. And what's interesting in the Bible script that we read this morning, when you go back to the first book, Genesis, and you read of the creation of the world and the creation of Adam and Eve and they're placed in a perfect garden, the Garden of Eden, when they fall away from God and sin and suffering and death enter the world, we read they're thrown out of the garden and they always move east. And as you read the Bible, you discover that moving east is a sort of description of people getting further and further away from God. But these come from the east to the city of peace under the rule of another king. And it would cost them a great deal in time and money as they make the journey of some 1400 miles. On camels, we don't really know. 
But whatever the details, it would have been a hard journey taking a long time. And actually, when they arrive, they're foreigners. They're in the minority. The language is different. They're not the people of the city of Jerusalem. They're tourists. They're in the faith minority, but they are so serious about getting answers to questions that when they see a star in the sky, they want to know the answer. Something has happened, and so they want to find out more. And they're not happy to leave the question unanswered. They're not happy just to carry on with their own lives and just be contented in their own world because the star says something. The observations and scientific research reveals that there's something bigger, something more, something more than us, more than our world. And so they decide to go on a journey. And so they come humbly. And this is what I love about these seekers. They're prepared to say that they don't know everything. They go on a journey to find out. They don't have all the answers. And so they turn up at Herod's palace and they start asking, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? They don't ask the question, where is the one who will be born king of the Jews? And that's what makes Herod angry. But that's what makes them wise. Can you see it's about seeking and understanding? That's why we call them wise men and women. They're not prepared to just see the evidence, to be stirred to say there's someone on the stairs and then just carry on going up to bed. They want to find out. And so they come seeking, knocking and asking. And when they come to Herod, as they arrive at Jerusalem, they are pointed to the scriptures, an ancient script, part of what we read uh, this morning. Um, it's come from another world to them. But it tells them to go to Bethlehem, an extraordinary thing. Now, before we look at the next seeker, because it's interesting that their seeking, their world expands as they come into a whole new world. They're not just settled in their own country with their own language, with questions about life, but they're seeking answers. Everything changes. Their world is bigger now than when it started. They know more as their questions are being answered along the way. And so in verse 10 of that reading, uh, I don't know if you noticed, it tells us that they were overjoyed because something has come outside of themselves, something bigger in their lives, so much so that we're told that they worshipped. Again, something bigger to orbit their life around that has brought joy. Uh, and we're told that they bring gifts and those gifts tell us Something of what they understood of the significance of this child born, gold for a king. Frankincense is all about worship, something bigger than yourself. Myrrh is all about death and the afterlife. And so they understand something about this child who has been given, something that they didn't understand at first as all they had to go on was the star that appeared in the sky. And now they understand that he is a, a king and they understand that he's bigger than a king. He's to be worshipped. And so now they understand that there's something about his death that is going to bring them into more joy. Something bigger in their world that they could orbit around. Those are the seekers, number one. Let me ask you, whether that's where you are. I wonder if you're seeking after God, uh, seeking after those answers to the big questions of life. And, and have you found those answers? Have you found it in him? Because seeker number two, um, if you can call it that, is King Herod. He's actually the evil monster of the Christmas story. He's not an honest seeker, he's a poser. He pretends to seek when the wise men, the Magi, come to town. Um, he pretends to be interested. Where is the king going to be born? Um, but he's a poser. He's an imposter. He's a pretender. He has all the eyewitnesses. He has this community of humble, honest questioners who have come from the east seeking this king. And he too can observe the star in the sky. He understands actually that the Bible has said that this will happen. And so he's got all the witnesses and it's not that he doesn't believe them. He believes them all that a king is going to be born. It's what he does with the information that's the horror. 
because his actions are one of violence. Uh, the real Christmas occurs in the middle of genocide by a mad king hell-bent on destroying anyone who is bigger than him, anyone who has a bigger story than his. He wants to orbit around himself. He doesn't want to, to orbit around a bigger king, uh, bigger than King Herod. He's all about his small, tiny, puny world. And anyone who gets in the way of his tiny world, anyone who would interfere, anyone who's a bigger planet to orbit around, he wants to destroy and kill. And that's the real Christmas. Christmas happens in the midst of the slaughter of innocent children. Now, does the slaughter of the innocents have a place in your remembrance of Christmas? I confess that amid all the Christmas preparations and celebrations, I forget about the true blood and tears of Christmas. You may have heard of the carol that we don't tend to sing, Unto us is born a son. Uh, imagine it to the tune, Good King Wen Wenceslas Lass looked out. Um, here is one of the verses that if we ever did sing it, it's often missed out. This Herod saw a fray and grievously bewilder. So he gave the word to slay and slew the little children and slew the little children. And that aspect of the Christmas story is often forgotten. You know, someone who's hell bent on destroying the Messiah. I wonder if you've ever done that with God. Not as bad as King Herod, but, but maybe God has come to your attention and you say, actually, I don't want God in my life. I don't want to face up to the fact that there's someone bigger than me. Actually, I want a different world. I want my own world. I'm quite happy where I am, thank you very much. And actually, I wish, I wish he'd go away. Perhaps that's how you think about God. Herod was angry because he wanted his story. He wanted his kingship. He wanted to orbit around himself. And even more incredible, Jesus willingly, knowingly, enters that circumstance. He enters the mess. A defenceless baby wriggling in a manger with death all around him. And we learn later on that he's, he's snatched away to Egypt to become a refugee on the run for his life. That's the real Christmas story. And I guess, though, we're still asking those same questions in the world in which we live in. Because darkness is the real context of Christmas. Uh, we often read the passage from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And that's us. That's all of us. And do you know that Herod only lasted a few months after that? He died only a few months later. So actually, it was all a nonsense. But then there's a third seeker or seekers. Did you notice them? They are called the chief priests and the scribes. They are the Bible experts. Uh, when the wise men come to Herod, Herod says, let's ask the Bible question of the Bible experts. And they come out with a quote about Bethlehem being the place where they need to go. And these guys are interesting because they look at the Bible, this ancient script, but they don't know and they don't do anything about it. They know where to find it, but it's quite astonishing when you think about it. I wonder what they did do that evening. Herod was not known for asking Bible questions, but there doesn't seem to be any excitement. Uh, do you know Herod asked a question today about the Bible, about life, something other than himself? But they don't bother. They seem to be just in their own world. They are in their own world of religion. It doesn't seem to affect them. It doesn't seem to change them. It doesn't cause them to orbit around something bigger than themselves. They just give the answer and they just carry on as if the answer wasn't radical, that God has entered this world to become one of us. Do you know people like that? You know, in our world, there are the scientists who, who study the world and study biology. They look at the intricacies of human life and and they can't help but see a design to everything, but then they never look beyond themselves. I wish, I wish he wasn't there, even though they see it in the design of creation. So have you ever seen yourself there? 
Are you like the Magi, the wise person? You're looking to orbit around something bigger than yourself. Because at the end of the day, we are made for worship. Or are you like King Herod? It's all about you. The world is all about you and everyone else can orbit around you. Or maybe you would say, yes, I am religious. But like the religious, you never look up in wonder, love and praise. But there's a fourth seeker. And I guess this is the unseen seeker of, of this chapter. Um, it's the unseeker of the whole of the Christmas story. In fact, the whole of the Bible. And it's God himself. And at Christmas time, he comes to seek us. That actually God was somehow big enough to seek us, even though we were not seeking him. This is a love affair, one way. That God was big enough to become small, strong and powerful enough to become weak, uh, weak as a little baby, and become Emmanuel, God with us. Why? To seek us so that we might find him, to actually find joy and satisfaction and purpose, to find a star to move around that points us to a king to worship. Someone to guide us, someone bigger than ourselves, someone who loves us so much that he's prepared to come on a rescue mission, to come into the mess and the questions and the evil, not only in the world around us, but the evil in our own hearts. Because that's eventually what this baby, this child would go on to do. He would live the life that you and I could never live. And in fact, he would die the death that we deserve on the cross. And he would rise again to prove that it was Emmanuel, God with us. So he would be the king to orbit our lives around. He would be the king who we could come to know. And it would be a joy, someone to worship bigger than ourselves. And what is wonderful is that when you really start to investigate Jesus in the New Testament part of the Bible, and I would encourage you to do that. Take one of the Gospels, uh, Matthew, the Gospel that we've read, Mark, Luke and John. Read about Jesus. He's one of the most open and transparent people I know. Uh, do you know people like that? They're easy to come to and talk to and they're easy to ask and to seek and to knock on their door and they're only too happy to open the door and answer your questions. There are some people who are closed people, aren't there? You speak to them and they're prickly and they take things the wrong way and they get irritated. But Jesus was never like that. People who were a long way away from him loved to come near him. Those who were social outcasts, those who were uh, the beggars, those who were the sinners would come to Jesus. And even his so-called enemies were intrigued by him. And he says to each one of us, ask, seek and knock. And all because God has come down seeking us and saying, ask, what is it you want to know? What is it that you want to know about life? What is it that you want to know about the world around you in eternity? And, and seek, Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save the lost ones, those in darkness, I've come as the light of the world. Seek me. What is it that you're seeking for? Perhaps what is it that you're afraid of? Why don't you just knock on the door? Maybe you think the door is closed to you, but Jesus is there and he loves to answer and open the door because he is God, Emmanuel, God with us. And it's an extraordinary thing that when you seek and ask of him and he opens that door, suddenly life is bigger and grander and more beautiful and our tiny little worlds orbit around the big world of a God who loves us. So as we continue in the Christmas celebrations, uh, which one of those do you think you're most like? Which seeker would you be? Are you like the wise, the magi, seeking something that is bigger than you, something to orbit your life around? Perhaps you're like Herod, it's all about me and my world, or maybe the religious, but that's all there is. Well, come and know God who, who says, ask and seek and knock. And when you find God through Jesus, you will find that good news of great joy.
Okay, thank you, Adam, for increasing our understanding of God's Word and help us um, really to seek what God's purpose is for us. We're going to finish our service with um, a great song to remind us of God's grace. This is amazing grace. <laughs>